Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, Bill Tyne is a member of the executive board of the National Association of Home Builders, and uh, he is also very active in CNU and helped to build the uh, coalition that we have to try to reform the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA rules so that they'll allow uh, good urban development. And I'll be talking more about that as we go along. Uh, CNU is a organization of mostly architects and planners, but it also includes development, developers, uh, community activists, real estate people, uh, people that uh, argue and sometimes even get along. Uh, and it, it's uh, a group I'm very proud to be head of. Uh, when I was mayor, uh, I tried to figure out uh, how to get developers to develop in uh, Milwaukee. So I asked one of the developers why they weren't developing very much in Milwaukee, and he sent me this drawing of what he thought our development process looked like. And I said, well, there's so many lines and names in it, it it's hard for me to understand. So he said, all right, let me give you, a, I'll give you a picture of what I really think it looks like to me. And. Uh, So, uh, so we changed it. We, we didn't just change it by saying, okay, whatever you want to do, you can have a permit. We put a code in place and we put regulations and street dimensions and things like that, all the different things that make up a city. We put things in place that did what we wanted, what the people wanted, a good code. And if a developer obeyed that code, if a property owner obeyed that code, they'd get their permits as of right. And that's how we rebuilt the city, and that's how we doubled the population in the downtown and revitalized a lot of neighborhoods. But today I want to talk to you uh, for part of the presentation about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA uh, and HUD. Now, if, you're, if you uh, listen to Fox News and listen to uh, the Republican line on Fannie Mae, you would uh, think that there were two causes of the recession. One is Fannie Mae and the other is Acorn. And if you're a Democrat, you're probably kind of defensive about it and say, well, yeah, but aren't those good programs? And the fact is it's very complex. If, if a Republican congressman says that he wants to eliminate Fannie Mae, they go back to the district, three or four members of the National Association of Home Builders go to his office, and suddenly he's not against uh, eliminating Fannie Mae because FHA and Fannie Mae are about the only place you can get financing for mortgages right now, and so people don't want to do that. But there are problems with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that get in the way of communities and, and mayors and town council people and so forth who want to have good urbanism they, they want to have places that are beautiful, that they love, like downtown Oyster Bay. You know, some place that looks like a village ought to look. They want it. And they try to struggle with it. The developer comes in and they're afraid the developer's going to ruin the community, come in with strip sprawl and make the place worse, and they might. Uh, but how do they ever get it? Well, one of the obstacles are these federal programs. And so we're working on changing them. The Federal uh, Housing Administration Act passed in 1934, well-intended, FDR here, the Better Housing Program. That's what it was called. And it led to a lot of people getting mortgages who maybe never would have been able to get a mortgage otherwise. And so you end up with, like Levittown, uh, the popular mortgage going out uh, getting into the hands of the average American uh, with a low down payment and uh, very affordable. But there were problems. There were things built into the DNA of the FHA Act that were anti-urban and led to problems that we have today. Some of those problems were taken care of. One of them was that when it passed in 1934, it required racial segregation covenants. In order to get through the uh, Southern committee chair uh, that controlled the bill, they put that in, and they didn't remove it until 1949. 
and so it affected housing patterns, including right here in Long Island, uh, be, because of that federal law. But that was, that was corrected and amended. But other parts of it were not. And one of those is separate use zoning. And so we ended up, instead of having that nice village center with the retail and the coffee shop on the first floor, and Floyd's Barber Shop on the first floor, and then the apartments above, we ended up with things like this, Northland, the first big shopping center in America uh, back in uh, Detroit in 1950, or in Milwaukee just shortly thereafter, the, uh, another shopping center like that. Now it's been rebuilt, and it looks like it has apartments on the second floor, but those are fake. There's nothing behind those windows. Storage space and lighting and air, eating and air conditioning. That's what's on those floors. Because the developer can't put housing on there and have it sell into the secondary mortgage market of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA. And people say, why can't we have that nice thing on our little town in, in Suffolk County? Why can't we have the apartments above? Like, like in my grandfather's day? Well, because of these rules. And these rules are meant to, I'm not sure what they were meant to do. They were probably meant to reassure the banks that FDR wasn't gonna take over the whole banking industry. But now they've converted into something that assigns risk to mixed use, even though the millennials and all the young people coming up want this kind of mixed use development. They wanna live in interesting places where they go get a cup of coffee, or they can go to the, a clothing store, or they can hang out with their friends at a, at a restaurant. They want that. They don't want to be in isolation. And so this kind of development is now happening. There aren't malls being developed so much anymore, but these village centers, and this is what uh, Bayshore, which originally was a shopping center near Milwaukee, is now uh, as streets and blocks, but no residential above the stores. And another thing that disappeared in that post-war period was the terminated vista uh, on T intersections because the federal law weirdly made that something that the design code said shouldn't be done. Now that's starting to come back because the retailers like T intersections. You know why? Because you can see their name. You look down the street and you see Target or you go around the corner and you see Kohl's. This is in the Washingtonian Mall in Gaithersburg, Maryland. So these things are trying to come back. This is uh, another view of the one in, uh, in, in the Milwaukee suburb with the fake second story. Here's one with real second stories where the developer actually financed outside of the whole system uh, condos that are above the stores. That's Kentlands in Montgomery County in uh, Maryland. But what happened? Well, this is Payne Avenue where my grandfather had his carpentry shop back in the 1920s, and my uncle Earl had his plumbing shop in the 1940s until he retired about 10 years ago. Retail on the first floor, the plumbing shop, two apartments above, and when my grandfather went in to get his loan for that back in the 1920s, the banker said, great, you're diversified. If the carpentry shop doesn't work, so well, at least you'll be getting the rent. Or if the rent doesn't work so well, at least you have the carpentry shop. And that's the way the bank looked at it. But now, you go into Fannie, Freddie, FHA, and it assigns risk to that. and says you can't do it. In Fannie, it's 20%, only 20% can be non-residential. In Freddie Mac, it's 25%. And uh, it's also true of all the capital programs that help rental housing. So the same thing. So this is an Italian neighborhood in Milwaukee, retail on the first floor, pre-World War, pre War I neighborhood. You can't build that new. Uh, this is Oak Park, Illinois, same thing. Fannie Mae says no, you can't do it. You might lose money on it, you can't do it. Like they don't know, they don't lose money on the way they're doing it now. <laughs> uh, FHA, you can't do it. HUD. You, you go there, they say, this is where they are. That's where they learn their urbanism in this building. <laughs> the only place where you really find the apartments on the second floor is places like this, Disneyland or Disney World. 
Uh, or on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, if you build 30 stories, you can even have three floors of retail and it's not going to hit the 20%. Or you can do it in Brooklyn if you get Frank Geary and a bunch of other people to spend a lot of money and have a big subsidy from the city and so forth. But you can't do it on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. That's the traditional scene. Retail on the first floor, apartments above. Or in Hempstead, there it is. R the deli with the apartments above. You can't build that new unless you go find financing somewhere else because you can't sell those condos into the secondary market. And so you end up with stuff like this. In Los Angeles, this is in Hempstead, but if in Los Angeles, they'd call this a four plus one or a dingbat, that's another name for it, where you have parking under the building and then uh, four floors of apartments. That's the kind of thing that FHA, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the code loves that. That's what they're telling you to build. So you end up with stuff like this. This is in Brookfield, Wisconsin. You have big roads, separate use zoning, and all of it influenced by the national government. What you don't get anymore is like this, the most, one of the most successful neighborhoods in Chicago, Wicker Park. And what I want you to see here, because I'm switching gears now from coding to street dimensions, the, there are three major streets that come together in the middle of Wicker Park here. They all carry between 25 and 30,000 cars a day. They have one moving lane in each direction. They have parking all day because the merchants control the regulation of the street because they need that parking spot to be legal so that you as a consumer will have the illusion that you might actually get that parking spot <laughs> so that the people that do drive might come to that street. And so these streets work for retail and they work for social gathering. There's restaurants and all kinds of things on the street. And people even drive on the streets, 25 to 30,000 vehicles a day. And it works. And it's congested. But it's not just congested with traffic. It's congested with customers and money and high rents and retail and tax base for the city. All that stuff is there. And so you as local officials and residents of communities, taxpayers, you've got to start thinking about these things a little bit differently than you did before. What's the purpose of a street? If you let Albany and the New York State DOT decide what the purpose of a street is, they'll tell you what it is. It's to blow traffic through your community and through your neighborhood. That's the only purpose of the street. It's to defeat congestion, to eliminate congestion. But congestion is not all bad. Congestion is like cholesterol. You have good cholesterol, you have bad cholesterol. And if you're a retailer, you like a little bit of congestion. I mean, if you really want to see what it's like, if you had all of your streets be just about traffic, you can, you can see that. You can go to Detroit. Just go to Detroit and you can see they built $50 billion worth of freeways and they don't have congestion. They don't have much of a problem with congestion at all in Detroit. But if you go to some place that's really valuable in terms of real estate value, like Greenwich Village, it's congested, hopelessly congested, but congested with many, many things that are positive. That's also, this is Dundas Street in, uh, in uh, Toronto. One moving lane in each direction with a streetcar sharing the lane with the vehicles, parking all day. And it's a wonderful street. It's so crowded. It's like what Yogi Berra said. People don't want to go there anymore. It's too crowded. That's what he said. He said that about Greenwich Village. Uh, and you have places like Oyster Bay that have that kind of condition, and you love them. If all that mattered was congestion, you could bulldoze Oyster Bay, but you love it. People like to go there. It's a wonderful place to go on a Sunday morning and have a cup of coffee. So these things changed. I'm going to go very quickly now because I know Eric is, will prompt me at any moment to, to hurry up. But uh, where did these ideas come from, that the roads were only for one purpose, that they weren't for selling stuff or for social gathering, just for moving vehicles? Well, it didn't come from the Keokuk, Iowa Chamber of Commerce. It came from Le Corbusier, who was uh, a socialist, an intellectual, one of the leaders of the modernist movement. 
And he even said, kill the street. And so he came up with this idea of the street being just for moving vehicles, that it would be sort of a traffic sewer. The city of tomorrow, he called it. And it's built. If you go to Crystal City near the Reagan Airport in Washington, D.C., you can see it. The Thomas Jefferson Highway looks exactly like the picture that he drew in 1922. And the street is only for moving vehicles. Or you can uh, go to Oscar Niemeyer, who designed Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. Oscar Niemeyer actually is a communist. It, you know, so when you think about these big road ideas, um, it's not necessarily <coughs> the all-American uh, way. But this is Brasilia, where all the major streets are grade separated. And that's the, the kind of situation that the pedestrian sees when they try to walk around in Brasilia. And there's almost no successful retail in the city. You have to go to the slums outside the city to find a good restaurant or a good club. So anyway, we have these streets. This is a street in Milwaukee. And this is what engineers would have learned in the 1920s. A two-rod street, two rods from the center lane to the building line, 50 feet of pavement, parking on each side, low-cost housing on the, on the second and third floors, low-cost housing that was built before the federal government had any housing programs. And now the housing programs make it almost impossible to build that kind of form. So we need to change. This is Lodi, Wisconsin, a little tiny town that has wonderful urbanism, even though it's only got about 6,000 residents. But this is what the government mandates. If you went to the New York State DOT uh, Green Book, which they get from AASHTO, the national organization, of DOTs, this is what they, they, they consider the ideal street. 72 feet of pavement, 20 foot center lane, uh, median in the middle, so you can have a double pork chop turn lane, and then big clear, clear zones on each side uh, so that the, there's about 100 feet away from the road on each side, and no money left over for a sidewalk, so the people that uh, walk have to uh, walk in a dirt path, or they can walk in the gutter. Uh, and that's what's mandated by the regulations. And what happens to communities when these things are really applied? This is New Orleans. This is Claiborne Avenue in 1947 when Louis Armstrong lived on the street. And uh, this is how it looked. The median, they had 2,000 live oak trees on three miles of boulevard. In 1966, they decided to solve their congestion problem, and they did. And they built the freeway. There were 200, 200 businesses on that street. Now there's less than 20. But the city wants to build it back. That's one of the projects CNU is working on, to restore the boulevard and remove the freeway. Uh, the most dramatic example of this is in Seoul, Korea. At the end of the Korean War, uh, as a gift of American taxpayers. This was built right through the middle of Seoul, Korea, right over the river that runs right through the middle of the town. The mayor, who was elected in 2001, said, no, let's get rid of it. Let's put the river back in. They did. Real estate market did terrific. They didn't try to replace the capacity. They have two lanes on each side of the river. It's just an ordinary street now. It used to have 150,000 cars a day. And now uh, it was just absorbed into the street grid. And there's the mayor, who's now the president of South Korea, Lee Myon Bak. Look how happy he is. <laughs> That's what happens if you have the courage to do what's right. And then he got elected president, for crying out loud. <laughs> now, in understanding traffic and how it's distributed, the complexity of the grid, whether it's a street grid in an old place like Oyster Bay or Hempstead or whether it's in a brand new community, the complexity of the street grid is something that allows traffic to distribute it. It actually absorbs congestion. And so you can see that with the wetland. The, the water engineers now understand that the wetland is important. It absorbs water. It's a complex place. It's a great setting for plants and animals that are valuable. There's all kind of benefits to it. So we don't pave the streams much anymore. It still happens once in a while. Somebody will uh, get one of those earmarks through Congress. 
and build one of these dumb things. But with the roads, it always happens. All the DOTs in the country, except maybe Oregon, why are they always ahead of the curve? It's almost sickening that they do that. But um, anyway, this is, what the, this is the template that's used by the DOTs across the country. They're interested in through traffic and only in through traffic. So you have the freeway, the arterial road, the service road, and then the local roads, the grid in the upper left-hand corner. They don't care about that. But that's where your tax value is. That's where the sales tax money is. That's where the property tax money is. And that is uh, what we need to get the federal and state governments to realize that's important too. And it actually helps traffic distribute better. The grid in Washington, D.C. really works well. And it's a great setting for real estate value. And it's a great setting for uh, all kinds of social things. And Madison, Wisconsin, with the state government and the University of Wisconsin, two big employers, they have no big roads at all. They just have their street grid. And somehow these uh, people are able to make their way through the streets without being, having the Wisconsin DOT tell them which street to go on. But in, uh, yeah, gotcha. in Detroit, um, they've covered the city with giant roads and degraded their grid and ruined the place. So think about that. When you're studying what to do on Long Island, uh, think about what actually works best. What adds the most value? What infrastructure adds the most value? One of the things we produced with the Institute of Transportation Engineers, that's the Organization of Traffic Engineers, is this book on walkable urban streets. And you can download this for free from ite.org or cnu.org, either of our websites. And uh, you can get a copy of the hard copy book for uh, 25 bucks from the same place. And it's calibrated for big cities, villages, little cities in between, uh, towns, villages. And you can apply this. Elgin, Illinois has, this is a suburban location where they had a lot of problems. They put the street grid in place and it added value. In Santa Clara County, California, they're retrofitting the parking lots around the Cisco headquarters. They're putting in streets. They're making it more functional and much more valuable by inserting urbanism. And that's Savannah, Georgia, where they've extended the grid. Or Pasadena, California, where they've built uh, 500 units of housing right around the transit station in the formerly automobile-dominated city of Pasadena. Or in Milwaukee, where we've done the same thing along our river walk. I'm going to just move to the end here uh, to uh, facilitate uh, Eric's uh, good feeling about keeping on schedule. But I just wanted to invite you to, uh, if you're interested, to find out more by going to cnu.org or coming to our annual meeting, which is May 9 through 12. Jan Gell, the former planner of Copenhagen, will be there along with Richard Florida and many, many other people, including Eric Alexander, if you don't see enough of him when you're in Long Island. Um, so if you, uh, you're most welcome to come to that. Thank you very much.